come on in. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh, I can't contain my excitement. Yes, Listen, girl. if you are watching live right now, I want you to share it, share it, share it. Invite your friends, invite your homegirls. Like I always say, pull up a seat and just get your popcorn if you need it. I am just so humbled. This is our third episode of Girl You Can yeah. Do. And I've just gotten so many rave reviews from everyone from my last episode with my friend Sarah Smith. And today I have my beautiful, gorgeous, amazing okay. Okay. warrior. Okay, she said Dr. Lorraine Tweeter. Y'all put your hands together for her. No, hey guys. Listen, listen. Uh, Dr. Tweeter. Lorraine. Amazing. Lorraine. I call her Lorraine, but she's a whole doctor, comma, MD. And Lorraine and I, we went to medical school together. And when I tell you that she was my saving grace <laughs> during that season. You were mine. And, and she really kept me in the presence of the Lord. Let's just say that. That's been was my soul sister during that process. And so I'm just so humbled and honored for her to be able to join us tonight. Her bio is amazing. Her life story is amazing. And I'm just going to read a quick blurb and then we're going to go forward with this. Okay. She's brutally honest and y'all love, y'all going to love her. But anyways, Dr. Lorraine Tweeter was born in Liberia and she received her bachelor's from the State University of New York post-dam where she majored in biology and minored in chemistry. She then obtained her medical degree from the American University of Antigua and she's currently a resident at the United Health Services Wilson Medical Center in Binghamton, New York. And so put y'all hands together for the beautiful Lorraine. Oh You're making me blush. I mean, you're fantastic, Lorraine. I don't know if you know, but you're a boss, okay? <laughs> so just to start um, off our discussion tonight, can you just talk us through your journey? What was it like moving from one place to another and getting on the career path that you're on right now? Okay, so, I mean, I kind of always knew, sort of, kind of, <laughs> that, you know, I wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. But... Um, so I went to a Potsdam and, you know, we take the MCAT for medical school. So I took that, um, didn't do as well as I thought I should have done. Yeah. So then it was like, should I do this? Should I not do this? So at that point, I decided that I was going to do neurosurgery research, get a PhD in that, which is what you're doing, <laughs> which, yeah. which is what you're doing now. But funny story is uh, my roommate at that time, she asked me, we had a college fair and she asked me to go there. Mm -hmm. I would normally go there just to get pens. I like college fair <laughs> pens. <laughs> yeah. And that's where I met AUA, my medical school. Our, that's where I met the school. They uh, spoke to me, uh, told me I didn't have to go through the long process. And I was like, okay, let me try this. Ironically, it worked out. <laughs> uh, medical school you know was a mess um <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was rough it was very rough um but you were the guy did it then we got to after medical school the next step would be you know to apply to residency which is where all medical graduate ap apply and then uh travel all over the u.s take a tour of the U.S. to different hospitals, and hopefully that one program like you enough to accept you. Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother stressful process. Mm -hmm. And once you get a position, you start, everyone start in July. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, I was one of those who got the position. So here I am, uh, trying to survive. You are surviving, and we are so proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. you are. And Lorraine, you are absolutely amazing. Just seeing your tenacity throughout this entire process and how strong you've remained and firm in making sure that whatever plans that you have set out, you put in God first, of course, but you're staying the course. And so can you talk to us a little bit about 
during this career path, what would you say was a breaking point, you know, in where you were just kind of struggling to say, mm, is this for me? Is this what I'm called to do? And how did you get through that? Uh, the breaking point, I would say one, I had two. Um, <laughs> as if one is not bad enough, I had two. Um, the first one was when I didn't do well in the MCAT, the test to get into medical school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had offers for places for a PhD program in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking, you know, is this for me? Because here is this, you know, PhD program. They pay me to go there. Mm -hmm. They pay me to go there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then here is medical school. I pay to go there. Right. pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to go there. <laughs> so uh, I was thinking, thinking, thinking. And then when the MCAT didn't go well, I said, you forget that, you know, I'm going to PhD school. Mm -hmm. But then even when I would have meetings with the, you know, these universities concerning that program, mm -hmm. something felt like, you know, it wasn't right. Yeah. And in the back of my mind, I felt like even if I had went to get PhD mm -hmm. um, in whatever, I would have eventually circled back to medical school. Mm. So for me, it was like, do I want to do it now or do I want to do it later? Mm -hmm. uh, some people prefer to do it later. Some people uh, take different path and then eventually come back. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to be the person who says I should have done this earlier. Um, this has always been my lifelong goal. Mm -hmm. I, I think going for a PhD at that time seemed easier for me. Mm -hmm. um, it was the offers were lined up for me versus mm -hmm. taking the effort, the energy, the strength, yeah. or the willpower to get to medical school. Mm -hmm. That was the first breaking point. The mm -hmm. second one, so I graduated medical school and then applied for the residency, which is like your doctor in training. Um, that was the whole stress. Um, there is the anxiety of, am I good enough mm -hmm. compared to other people? Because you're applying with the United States, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. You're applying with the, you're competing with the United States, medical students right. from the United States, the entire world, because you name the country, they want to come here to train. So yeah. you're literally like in the midst of all these people. And then wow. that's when self-doubt come in, you know, and it sneaks in. Mm -hmm. You can be the strongest of person. You won't even realize that the doubt is just in your head, you know? you're like sleeping in the middle of the night your heart is pounding like did that match <laughs> so, so uh yeah but um mm -hmm. somehow god did it so yeah yeah it's, it's just amazing just hearing you kind of talk about your highs and lows what stuck out to me was really perseverance right because it's only natural for you to have what we call imposter syndrome like you pray like god <clears throat> get me to this med school then you get to med school you're like do i really belong here and they say god i want to graduate from medical school and get into this hospital then you get there you're there you're a doctor you're thriving and then you're like but uh maybe i don't belong here maybe it's not for me and so can you talk about like who do you feel like was in your village who do you feel that you were surrounded by to help you push push through when you had those moments of uh there's doubt there's maybe maybe I don't belong here I feel like you know you belong here but there are moments that. where there were no. highs and lows. Wait, who did you feel like was in your village to kind of help you push through uh I like how you say village because <laughs> it took one yeah. <laughs> it's still taking one mm -hmm. so definitely you I mean I tell everybody oh, about you Miss Glory you and your parents Thank God for your family. I mean, yeah. girl, there is your family. There is my mother, my parents, mm -hmm. my entire family, mm -hmm. friends, my church. Yeah. It took everyone because like I said, even when I started the position here, I mean, uh, they, the nurses come up like Dr. Twitter and I'm just like, me? Wow. Yeah. You know? And then they asked me a question. I realized like, I don't know this stuff. 
you know, I don't know this yeah. stuff. And then there is that, like you said, do I belong here? And having people to remind you who you are is important mm -hmm. because in certain situations, especially when the environment changes and you are trying something new, mm -hmm. but the first time a new position, wherever it may be, mm -hmm. that comes in and it's so quick and easy yeah. to forget who you are for a moment. But yeah. then I call you and you're like, <laughs> Snap out of it. Snap out of it, right? <laughs> and then I called my mom and my mom was like, you worry because, you know? <laughs> then I'm like, yeah, I, I'm a child of God. I got this. I know who I am. Yeah. So like that, I mean, it's, it's an on and on battle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know we were talking earlier before we went live about the toxic masculinity that's all up in it you know and i think it's not only people women of color of course we experience that but it's not only in the field of medicine it's every, everywhere girl yeah. and so can you just talk to the people a little bit about what what your experience has been like with dealing with certain men in power and kind of how are you gonna how do you use that as kind of a launching pad to say you know what i'm gonna go into cardiology because i know that's the field that you want to go into I mean, there are several things. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately for me, uh, I'm a woman. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I'm Black. Uh, and I happen to look younger than my age. Right. So, <laughs> which equates to, um, you know, m m miss or whatever, mm -hmm. pat and shoulders, but no. Mm -hmm. um, we are doctors, right? Mm -hmm. We are, it's all like qualifications, gender, race, age, doesn't matter at all. And it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, I love being black. I mean, I love being black. Yeah. Not to make this a race issue, but I love my skin color. I love that I'm African. I love where I come from. Yeah. Everything about me, I love it. Yes. Um, I love my jeans I got from my mother that makes me look young. <laughs> I love it all. So being trying to get into a male dominated field is definitely sometimes can be intimidating, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I mean, life is full of challenges. Yeah. Anything that's really easy to do, probably not worth doing. So mm -hmm. I know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I know this is what I want to do and I'm going to give him my best shot and above all Jesus is by my side. So I go. love, I love I love what you just said. Anything that is easy to do is not worth doing. And I think we live in a time frame or a generation where a lot of young people want things, right. but they're not willing to really sacrifice and put in the hard work to get there. Because once they start on the path of, let's say, becoming a doctor and it gets hard, they're like, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. Forget this. I'm going somewhere else. This is not for me. Rather than stick, stay in the course and say, you know what? I'm going to be dealing with people's lives. So of course, this is not going to be easy. Right. And then once I get there, it's going to be rewarding. It's going to be rewarding in the end. And so how do you deal with that stress of, being a millennial, I know your, your, your everyday life. I know you have a busy day, busy work days. Sometimes I, I text you and you're like, girl, I have a night shift. <laughs> I'm in here late. And so, you know, we have these expectations in society of, oh, you should be married at this age. Okay. Oh, you should have kids, a whole bunch of kids. You know, I, I mean, yeah. my parents, they were young at, you know, my parents too. Had kids by our age they had a whole family my and mother had three at my age wow yeah and <laughs> so how do you deal with you know that that balance or blending you know personal mm -hmm. life with uh with your work life and or do you just kind of find yourself you know I'm working hard now and those things will kind of fall into place so I think everyone have different priorities mm -hmm. uh, for some people, they 
you know, prefer or rather would rather establish a family and then go for a career. Mm -hmm. uh, for one, I can say that I'm happy. I don't have a child. I cannot imagine doing this with a child. Um, yeah. yeah. But, you know, people, especially being African, right? Um, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a taboo. Yeah. To not be married, right? Um, at my age, and it's like, you should get married. I mean, even people have told me, like, how, why are you even worry about education education wow. should be worried about getting married but wow. in all that talk is ignorance right mm -hmm. because there are tons of people that get married fine and then they're struggling mm -hmm. things are tough but i believe personally in planning mm -hmm. i have put a lot of energy effort planning uh in my life to make me who I am to reach this far. Of course, uh, when it comes to marriage, I definitely think about it. But above all, you want someone who would not only compliment you, but bring the best out of you. Right. One of the things I realized is it's better to be single and be in peace mm. than to settle for something I saw a post the other day that said a lot of people who are married, especially women, are not necessarily happy. They just are glad to be married. And it hit me, right? Is it worthy just to say I'm married and be miserable? And you know, I mean, we are God-fearing people, right? We cannot just go and <laughs> marry anyone. Like I personally get people asking me, but then above all, I take my relationship with God very seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, so if a man doesn't like, we have to be equally yoked. We, right. We have to be. If we're not on all I mean, levels, all levels. Uh, I'm not a supporter of a man. I like being pampered. I like. <laughs> nice, I like being pampered. I like nice things. Um, so you have to. Yeah, and you don't have to be a doctor, of course. I mean, I would not personally like to marry another doctor. I mean, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. <laughs> but you know, God comes in plays, be a good person and all that stuff. And our generation is a mess. Mm -hmm. um, we live in a generation where things are just crazy. Everything is fast. You know, dating means you have to be intimate with everyone you date, which I think is ridiculous. Right. Right. Uh, so it's crazy. I mean, with all that, I take my time. Um, I'm always open to meet people. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it doesn't work out, so like, <laughs> that's life. I don't pressure myself too much. I mean, yeah, yeah. Most and and I, I commend you for that because you're just an awesome woman and I always oh talk gosh. about you and brag about so you. So you're just, you're just an awesome woman who just, you know what you want, you're focused and you're not going to stop until you get there. And oh, that that's lacking. I think in, in our generation, you know, they want the, the clout, the money, the fame, the, the, the bling, the jewelry, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's really about your character. And just knowing you personally, you have an awesome character yes. and there should be more doctors like you because some of these doctors out here are just very questionable, but that's another, that's another story for another day. So for the girl that's out there that wants to be a doctor, tell us about what your day-to-day -day looks like in, in your residency right now. So, I mean, it changes. Yeah. So I will give you an example of each rotation every month or sometimes every two weeks, there are different rotations. So recently I was in the ICU. Mm -hmm. um, so the shift here, it's like, uh, for instance, Monday, it would be 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, then the following day, it would be 6 a.m. to 5. Then after that, it's 7.30 p.m. to 12 p.m. the next day. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it seems like, 16 hour shifts of course um you come early <laughs> if you start at six you come early because you want the work done mm -hmm. um and you just work you yeah. work and try to learn as much as you can 
I mean, unfortunately for us with COVID, it makes everything twice as hard. Yeah, I was just about um, to ask you, what is COVID? How's that been? <laughs> I mean, I experienced, you know, clinicals in medical school without COVID. Mm -hmm. Now we have COVID where if before you could just go into a patient room like, hey, how are you doing? How was your night? How's everything? Now it's like you have to wear the PPE. First of all, there's the problem of breathing through that mask all day long. That's like it gives the headaches like no other. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the challenge. So everything's just a little harder, you know, the PPEs from in and out. You wear it, you go in, you come out, you wear it. And that's just it. So that's another thing. And then if I'm on night shift, night shift is two weeks night shift here. We do 6, 7 p 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, sometimes, you know, a little later you leave. Uh, and that's challenging. Night shift is tough. Uh, there are one senior resident, two interns, interns at the first year. Um, we have this thing called pagers. I hate them on my soul. <laughs> um, if you guys don't know what pager is, um, this generation probably don't. And probably don't. <laughs> it's very good that way. You don't want to know what this is. So basically, it's like a, a mini um, device. And it just beep, 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 all night long. And then you see the number, you call the number. Nurse is like, patient need this. And you're like, okay patient, come see patient, <laughs> we go do it. So we do that all night. On top of that, you're admitting patients. Wow. Um, then you're running rapids. Rapids is like if a patient has an acute change in their status, they call us to go there. Mm -hmm. Some nights it, you can have CPR, which is patient going to cardiac arrest. And, you know, you have to do the whole shebang. So it gets busy. And then other rotations would be like floors. Mm -hmm. um, where here we see eight patients each. So I have my set of eight patients from admission to discharge. We treat them, try to get them well, and then discharge them to home rehab or whatever. And that mm -hmm. shift is seven to six. Wow. And then there is clinic. Clinic <laughs> is, you know, nine to five. <laughs> you go there and it's normally one day off a week you get. Um, in the ICU, the days off are a little uh, different, but yeah, and you do this for three years. Oh my gosh, Lorraine, you're a superhero. No, like, <laughs> I did this for three years. Thank you for your service because that was a lot. How do you manage just self-care? Because I'm sure after that, you just sleep, you just uh, go to so, sleep. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like sometimes my eyes is like someone set it on fire. Mm -hmm. I feel yeah. the burn. It's just like <laughs> the burn, like because, for instance, in the ICU, sometimes you get there set like you get there seven p.m. in the night. Wow. You leave twelve p.m. the next day. Wow. That's like sixteen hours. So the eyes is like burning on fire, and you can't sleep. Oh my gosh. You can't really sleep. So I sleep when I get home, like mm -hmm. I just sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I sleep like I don't I, I just sleep because you have to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then other days after every ICU rotation, I go get a full body massage. Ooh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first time, the first time I went to do the massage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard things clicking and I was just like, what is, what is that noise? It's just like, that's your body. <laughs> we love a massage. Listen, <laughs> self-care. When we were in Antigua, we couldn't do that. So now <laughs> take advantage of that. Was, oh my God. I was thinking about the other day where we were in Antigua and there was a whole hurricane. Girl. And, and remember we were stuck in my house together <laughs> in your house together and I mean even though it was terrifying because we thought the roof was gonna come off the house it was so much fun <laughs> I okay. have no idea why that was fun but it was it was fun we had we cooked we cleaned we taught we studied and it was just an awesome moment and just to awesome see yeah. where you are now if people only knew what Antigua was like and 
that that whole process and you know it, it was it was unconventional right because you don't often hear people talk about caribbean med school and that even being an option but mm -hmm. even though it was rough i think it really prepared us for where we are now to have that that tough skin to keep pushing to keep fighting and honestly i feel like it helped us kind of know more than other students who are in other uh, medical schools, you know, I think it is that tenacity, that grit to be like, listen, we survived a hurricane. We know what it's like to not have lights. We know what it's like not to have water <laughs> and survive a hurricane in medical school. That's unheard of. That's unheard of. Not being able to call our family and be like, we're alive. It's unheard of. And so when people complain about just little things, you're just like, listen, if you could get through Antigua, you right. can get through anywhere. Anything. Literally, we can get you anything. I was thinking about it the other day. And, you know, here we have U.S. medical student coming to rotate. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just want to thank the American <laughs> medical school for caring and looking out for the students. Yeah yeah it was not so for us it was not I mean, so for us yeah it was not so for us and mm -hmm. what i like most about someone asked me the other day if i had a choice of not going to a caribbean medical school mm -hmm. would i do it again mm -hmm. i would because mm -hmm. it shaped me differently i think um i have always been a calm person but going to a Caribbean medical school, first of all, <laughs> let me list the troubles. You got the crazy drivers. That's number one. The crazy drivers. You, <laughs> you, you got the professors who you don't know what they're saying. Who remember um one of the likes? <laughs> <laughs> you don't you understand know? what they're saying. What they're saying. And then you teach yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important thing I learned from the island is that for me, Lorraine, to get here, I have to fight for myself. Wow. I have to teach myself. I have to do this myself. Mm -hmm. um, I can't rely on these teachers to just give me the knowledge. I have to go out of my way to get it. And that's how residency is here. You're, you're teaching yourself. Yeah, you learn things. When we see the patient has a group, the attendings, which is the doctors in charge, would tell us, oh, this is this, this is this. But it's up to us to go read about it, go learn about it, go investigate. If we have a patient who isn't improving, mm -hmm. It's up to you to say, why isn't my patient improving? Right. right. This patient should have been gone like three days wow. ago, yet it's still here. Mm -hmm. What can I do for this patient to get this patient out of here? So then you have to go read. You have to go investigate. You have to go do your own research, find out, read other studies, and like try to get your patients out of there. So I love that about AUA. I mean, if you can survive, girl, mm. You can make it anywhere. You can make it anywhere. <laughs> the struggle ground. Mm -mm -mm. So we're about to close soon. And I want anyone who's watching tonight, feel free to put questions in the chat. If you have any questions for the beautiful Dr. Tweeter, and I'm, I always say doctor because it has weight. Okay. Put questions in the chat if you have any, but what is the biggest lesson that you've learned so far? through this process? Well, I would say two. Mm. The number one is you have, I've learned to believe in myself mm -hmm. because I, yes, people believe in me. Sometimes people may not believe in me. And even if people believe in me more than I believe in myself, mm -hmm. it takes myself to realize like I'm good enough, mm -hmm. one. I can do this too, and I'm here for a reason. Mm. Without believing in myself, I think I would have gave up a long time ago because it was so easy to give up, girl. Mm -hmm. You saw how people left the island and went home. Listen, we started off with what, 400 students? 425. I'll never forget that number. Yep. They said, look to your left, look to your right. <laughs> I bet these people won't be sitting by you in a few months. And they were right. 
by med four med five it was a handful i have four people and that's the first thing i've learned to believe in myself the second thing which i will make the number one thing in my life is above all i trust god mm-hmm. i trust him yeah all the ruckus happening in the hospital i'm just like jesus i know you're here i know you're here yeah I'm not by myself. Yeah. I think without God in my life, I probably would have went nuts. <laughs> Just went crazy because this is crazy. Residency is hard. It's so hard. I've done a lot of hard things, right? Yeah. This makes medical school look easy. Mm-hmm. It makes medical school look very, very easy. I mean, wow. compared to this, medical school was like a walk in the park. Wow. This is very hard, especially the first year. You're, I'm learning the hospital system. I'm learning the hospital coach, culture. Every work environment has their own culture. Mm-hmm. They have their own politics. I hate politics. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, I never went to law school. Now I'm learning politics, right? Wow. So it's like yeah. all this kind of stuff. And you're working with different people, how to relate to. It's a yeah. lot it's a lot but you're like my dad always says you're built for this yes I've seen you and you're definitely built for this Wahab just um commented (laughs) congratulations Dr. Tweeted it was awesome to see you both on this platform sharing knowledge thank you Wahab thank you I guess my last question for you tonight oh let me let me say this one thing go ahead go ahead I mean I love Wahab like yeah god sent him in my life to like literally help me through the match process yes i had no idea i mean i had an idea but like the details i didn't know Mm -hmm. and he kept me on top of everything wow like everything lorraine did you do this no i'm gonna (laughs) go do it now (laughs) lorraine did you do this no i'm gonna go do it now wow so talking about God putting people in our lives at certain times to help us shoot. He's still helping me now. Wow. He's still helping. I'm still asking him questions and he is still helping me. Yeah. That's Thank so important. You, <laughs> Thank you, Wahab. <laughs> Thank you, Wahab. And it's, it's just it's just awesome to have people who hold you accountable. He does. Right? He definitely he does. And Ruth having someone Ruth. to hold you accountable, like when you feel like, mm, or you forget if they're like, come on, get yeah, it together. Me, no emotions, Lorraine. Uh uh-uh. uh, what are you doing? <laughs> that's important because a lot of us, a lot of us want people that's going to sugarcoat stuff or baby us, you know, and say, oh, it's going to be all right. You, you need that. But then you also do somebody honest. with you, like, who's honest with you and say, okay, very don't, drop honest. The ball. don't drop the ball on this okay get it together honest and I really love him and appreciate him for that like I could call him like pep talk me Wahab no why did you do this look why are you not doing this and I'm just like why did I even call him (laughs) you're not making it better (laughs) I like him like he even with the step three exam he kept me on top of it Mm. made me register for the exam we studied for it together he took it unfortunately I couldn't and even after he kept on asking me did you register for the exam did you register for the exam so I love him for that I think thank God for you Wahab I love you (laughs) I love you Wahab love we love the people that push us you know and so um, my last question for you is, where do you see yourself in a couple of years? What is like your ultimate, ultimate dream, ultimate plan in regards to, you know, remaining in the field of medicine and continuing to impact the lives of others? So I have a couple, actually. Um... <laughs> Go ahead, girl. I have a couple. I mean, so... Ultimately, like I said, I would like to be a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. And then um, secondly, like my parents recently opened a clinic in Liberia. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to do missionary trips, not only to Liberia, but other places. Because for one in my country, I don't know if you've been to a third world country, girl, it's rough. 
Like it is rough. A lot of the resources are lacking. Facilities are poor. I once had an uncle who came to America and he said they diagnosed him with a heart failure. And I said, oh, how did you know they diagnosed you with a heart failure? He's like, they did an EKG and told me I had a heart failure. And I'm like, mm. I've never heard of such. Mm -hmm. Don't they have to do like, you know, mm -hmm. and things like that? He's like, no, we don't do that. They do EKG and say you have heart failure. Oh my God. So I'm like, I don't think you have heart failure. Maybe you should go work up here. So he mm -hmm. came here, went to get work up. He did not have heart failure, girl. <laughs> That's not funny, but it's not, it's not, but that's Africa. So it, it yeah. takes a lot. I think mm -hmm. it's good that I came here. I live in America. I got the education. I think the ultimate goal would be to give back Yeah, the Thank best you. way I can. But my other ultimate goal is I want to own several properties, go into real estate, you know, that's what I want to do. Yeah. But uh, we'll see where life takes me. Yeah, and I'm excited about where life is taking took you us. and where it's taking you. Oh, girl. Um, thank you, Jesus. We just, I'm just so thankful. Just looking back on where we started and to see where you are now, it's only by the grace of God. And it's the ultimate testimony of just how you have to stick it out. Just keep yeah. pushing. Whenever you feel like, no, you can't do it. Keep pushing, keep going. You know, as people, we have, like I always say, this set plan and things might not go how you expect it to go, but in the end, you will get to where you need to get through right. and you'll look back and be like, oh my gosh, I, I made did it. it. I did it. I didn't think I could do it, but I did it. I'm here. Oh my it's, God. Happening. <laughs> it's happening. And then a part of us is like, okay, what's next? What's After next? you done went through it, they're like, what's next? What's next? To see right. that you you are using your platform, you're, you're saving lives one day in and day out. And we are thankful for you. We are truly thankful for you. I'm thankful for you. And then you deciding that, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to pay this forward. I'm going to go back to where I came from and elevate that industry and, and help Africa in ways that I know are going to be just powerful. And, you know, I'm just so excited about the future. And I just want to thank you again for joining. <laughs> You're making me blush. <laughs> You're making me blush. <laughs> thank you so much for joining, Lorraine. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for your prayers, oh, no. for, your, for you and your mom's prayers. <laughs> listen, listen. One day we'll be able to sit on the stage and tell the full story. Right. We only had a couple of minutes to do it tonight. So I just want to thank you. And if do you have any last parting words for anybody just to encourage them tonight? Definitely believe in yourself. I mean, it sounds cliche, but like, you have to believe in yourself and surround yourself with good people, people who are more motivated than you, people with bigger dreams than you, people whose vision scare you. Because mm. there's no point in mingling with people who are content with nothing or content with being nothing. So eventually you get comfortable with nothing. Um, nothing meaning no dreams, no vision, not necessarily material things, but no, no vision. You're just comfortable doing whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I like Wahab. His dream is scary. <laughs> he has some big dreams, like big dreams. And I'm just yeah. like, oh goodness. Uh, and then when I think about you, I mean, what should I like literally ripped you into pieces mm -hmm. transform you into this yeah like something that should have made you so depressed mm -hmm. out of your mind made you yeah. so strong and look at you and you used to say you wanted to start a program like this and look at you i appreciate you lorraine because you know i called you and crying like i don't know what's going on <laughs> my life is over what is happening right now? And you just, you push me. God is good. Thank God. 
And so I thank you. Tonight. I'm humbled. I love you. I love you thank too. Thank you all for everyone watching tonight. Please feel free to share, like, post it, whatever you need to do to get this out and let people see my beautiful friend, Dr. Lorraine Tweeter. Can you tell the people where they can find you? I know you're super uh, busy. <laughs> so what is my Instagram name? <laughs> <laughs> So, like, I'm too busy saving lives. I don't got time for the social. <laughs> my, my Facebook is Lorraine Tweeter, L A U R E N E. Um, last name T U I D E R. Instagram, I think, is Lorraine underscore T. Yeah, I, I think, think that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> got it. <laughs> well, I want y'all to feel free to join us next time. Next month, we have an awesome speaker, and it's going to be a surprise. So, just tune in to see them next time. We love y'all. Thank you for the support. And remember that, girl, you can, you do, can it do it too. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.